Hey, y'all. Good afternoon and welcome to Soul Monade. I am Sonia Doswell. I'm sitting here with a special guest uh, on location and uh, we have a great announcement. We have just actually been picked up on network television. So Soul Monade will now be airing on KDSM Fox 17 in Des Moines, Iowa. We will start the second Sunday of October. It'll run every Sunday at 1030 a.m. Central Time. After that, then the link will go global. So please stay tuned to that. You can always uh, track us at www.soulmanad.com for more information. So we have a fantastic lineup of guests ready for you, just as we, as we always have. And we look forward to seeing you there at KDSM 17 and uh, continuing to get the message of Soul Manad, uh, inhaling love, excellent compassion out to everybody. So on the show today, we have a very special guest with us. Uh, we have Mr. Dylan Johnson here with us from Johnston, Iowa. And uh, Dylan, uh, thank you very much for joining us here on Solmanat. Well, thank you for having me, Sonia. It's going to be fun. It is going to be fun. Uh, Dylan has uh, worked as an intern here with uh, the Solmanad media team on various assignments. And so uh, instead of being behind the camera today, he is on the camera and he is our guest because uh, we have a very interesting subject matter to cover. And if I do say I am so proud of you, you are just um, such a compassionate, um, brilliant young man, uh, an entrepreneur, a great sense of business already. And you're a senior at Johnston High School and the young age of 17 17 and when do you turn 18 February 23rd <laughs> on the 23rd so only at the age of 17 you'll be amazed at what he's going to share with us today so without any further ado let's just go ahead and jump into this all right, all right. okay so uh affiliated through your uh, your family's church here in the local community, you guys had an opportunity to give back and sow into other communities right here in the United States, correct? Yes. And what is the name of that organization? Appalachian Service Project. Appalachian Service Project. Okay. And uh, of course, we all know that the needs are great in Appalachia. Um, we talk about that often here on Solmanad about um, the great needs around the world. And we're always encouraging everybody to do their part. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart, do something. Be proactive. Lock arms with a, a, an organization who, who is a, effective and, and makes a difference, in the lives, a difference in the lives of others or stretch out a hand with um, with compassion and do whatever you can to to bring uh, positive change, help, and assistance to the life of somebody else. And uh, the needs in Appalachia are tremendous. Now you have gone to the region and you have visited there on three separate occasions. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The past three summers, I've uh -huh. I've been to Kentucky the past three summers, but. Um, Appalachian Service Project works all throughout the Appalachian Mountain region. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so your group has gone there uh, to the Kentucky to the Kentucky region, then. Okay, and uh, part of why we're doing this interview is um, you are are. Uh, seeking a scholarship towards your college education and so you've come up with this this whole project um, and you have you've gone through the interviewing process it's actually a little bit of a, a competition and I would like you to go ahead and explain that just a little bit uh, the name of your project is tools for a stronger tomorrow is that correct that's correct the uh, the name of my project as you said is tools for a stronger tomorrow uh -huh. um, would you like me to explain it? Yeah, if you could. But, but before we do that, I am, I want to get this straight here. So there's a scholarship that you're going for, and that's called Uncommon Student Award. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And the name of the uh, Presidential Library Association that this is affiliated with? Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Association. I know that's kind of a mouthful, it but... Really <laughs> And where is this located? It's based out of West Branch, Iowa, which is Herbert Hoover's birthplace. Okay. And uh, the scholarship is based around Herbert Hoover's experience as a uh, philanthropist uh -huh. and the work that he did with charities um, and how he chose to give back to the world and uh -huh. his community. Okay, so Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Association. Yes. <laughs> Don't ask me to say that 10 times. And it is in what town here in Iowa? It's based out of West Branch, Iowa, okay. which is Herbert Hoover's birthplace. Okay. All right. So uh, 
the name of the scholarship is Uncommon Student Award. And you went ahead and you created this project and you went through the application process and submitted this. Is, is this correct so far? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And how many people applied? I think it was around 90 people applied. Mm -hmm. And out of those 90 people, there were 15 finalists um, that were selected based off of their essay, letters of recommendation, and so on through the application. Um, and so those 15 finalists are the students who were actually chosen to carry out their projects. And you have been selected of one of the, the 15 finalists, right? Yeah, I'm one of the 15 finalists. Okay. And what is the grand prize? What is, what is the, the big scholarship that everybody's after? Actually, there are three grand prizes, I guess you could say. Okay. Um, out of those 15 students, um, each one receives a $1,000 scholarship just for completing the project okay. and returning to West Branch on October 27th to present to the Board of Trustees all that you've accomplished mm -hmm. um, to make a case for yourself. Mm -hmm. And just for doing that, you get $1,000. And from those 15 finalists, they'll choose three mm -hmm. of which will get an additional $5,000. An additional 5000 on top of the one. Right. And mom and dad are loving this, aren't they? <laughs> They're having some fun, but <laughs> they've had their work cut out for them, too. <laughs> uh -huh. And your parents have actually gone to the region uh, with you on, on, on different trips, haven't they? Right, yeah. My, uh, my parents were actually the ones who got me started in it, uh -huh. I guess you could say. Uh -huh. Now, Dylan, before we, we delve into the project itself, um, Tools for a Stronger Tomorrow, can we talk a little bit about um, the, the folks that live there in the Appalachian region? Uh, what are their living conditions like? Well, nothing that I'm used to or nothing that we see in this community here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess I'll tell a story from last year when I went. Summer, it was way too hot the air conditioning right. wasn't staying in um, mm -hmm. they also didn't have working indoor plumbing they had they had a bathroom um, in the trailer but okay. the toilet didn't work oh. and the shower didn't work so uh, the only purpose it really served was for the mirror in there that was mm -hmm. smudged up and I mean how many children were living in this, this small space four four children um, three of which being teenagers same age as me, which was weird to see. Somebody who's in the same stage of their life in a completely different circumstance where um, they don't have the types of advantages that parents hope to bring their, to their children. Right. And I mean, this is really all they know. Mm -hmm. They have never experienced um, what it's like to have a, a stable home, mm -hmm. I mean, physically. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, they don't know what it's like to have that security, although the, the family ties are ridiculously strong. Mm -hmm. And um, what they lack in um, money, mm -hmm. they make up for tenfold with uh, the community connections mm -hmm. and strength in their family and mm -hmm. faith, and mm -hmm. they're a really inspiring people. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, I found that to be true, too, in my travels to Africa, is the, the family ties and the joy that they carry amongst themselves and the community ties are just incredibly strong. So can we talk a little bit more about the community? So you guys go down there with a team of how many? I believe we went down there with a team of around 35 this year, mm -hmm. and um, we stayed in a an elementary school. We stayed in the gym of an elementary school. Uh, so you didn't stay at the Ritz? <laughs> no, far from the Ritz. But we, we were lucky this year. We actually had a, a nice elementary school to stay in mm -hmm. with air conditioning. Wow. Um, we've gone times before when there are a hundred some people in the gym and there's no air conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard stories about a couple years ago when they went and the entire place was infested um, mm -hmm with insects and with cockroaches so people would be sleeping and next to them they could hear cockroaches. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been lucky when I've uh, mm -hmm. gone. I haven't had um, the worst experiences, but I mean, just being in a place where showers weren't readily available. I mean, there right. were four showers for about 100 people, mm -hmm. um, cold showers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's weird and it's 
it's not familiar for me. No, no, because it's not the the conveniences that that we know to have at home, and and yet you're there for a week or two. These teams go for a week or two. Um, however, this is how these people live on a daily basis. So we're, we're talking extreme poverty, aren't we? Yeah, definitely extreme. Poverty. And how is their supply of uh, food? And um, we talked a little bit about their shelter. So how is their supply of uh, food and clothing? Well, um, the first year that I went. Uh, I like to tell the story about the kids who were living there Mm -hmm. and um, we were there for five days working on the site. We're we're gone for a week but we were on the site for five days Mm -hmm. and during that time period I saw the kids eat nothing but this pink strawberry cake that they had gotten from a Walmart um, a few miles away and I mean the nutrition is poor, very poor to say the least. Um, it is definitely a region that has been, um, impacted by the effects of their crippling poverty and you, it's, it's noticeable in their health. Um, Mm -hmm. the tobacco usage Mm -hmm. too is something that, um, is really weird for me to see Mm -hmm. kids that are chewing at age 13 and getting cigarettes from their parents. Right. Well, and even without the, the chewing and the smoking, the, the oral hygiene, I'm sure all of that is, is limited, and um, medical assistance and health care, is it limited in these, these regions, I'm sure? I, I'm, sure it, I'm sure it is limited to an extent. I think, I think the main problem there is just the, um, the knowledge, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that their education um, or their lifestyle really stresses the importance of nutrition. Right. Um, that being said, this year when I went, and I've heard this same type of story from many people that have gone before, um, they are incredibly willing to share whatever they have with mm-hmm. those who are working on their home. Mm-hmm. Uh, the house that mm-hmm. I was at this summer, we had two crews working on their house, actually, mm-hmm. and there are seven people per crew. Um, and my brother and his crew were at a neighboring house, mm-hmm. and um, the woman that we were working with on the last day that we were there actually made dinner for about 25 people. Um, with probably everything that she had in her pantry and refrigerator. Right. Mashed potatoes, turkey. It was a great lunch. And um, I think she used up quite a bit of um, her resources in giving it. But she was generous. She was generous and she and was grateful. happier than ever. Mm-hmm. And she was the most, one of the most grateful people I've ever met. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it speaks volumes, doesn't it? I've always said, I, I mention this a lot on Solmanad, I think that every um, American child or youth um, should serve in um, poverty-stricken areas like this somewhere in the world, whether here in the United States or in, in India or in um, various countries in Africa, or, uh, wherever the needs are, to go and, and to see it firsthand and experience it because it, it forever changes you, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, it just it gives you an entirely new perspective on what's important in life. I mean, once you once you come back, you see things in a different light, and it, it doesn't just end the day that you get back either. Right. I mean, you you really carry this with you from your day to day, don't you? Definitely, it's it's something that I think about periodically, and I I try and act in a way that um, I guess has has been inspired by realizing the the needs of others and the advantages that I and my community have been given. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you go there, you're there three times, you, you see the great needs, uh, you roll up your sleeves and you lock arms with, with others in your team and you do your part to give back, but um, that wasn't enough for you, was it? You could say that, I guess. <laughs> um, it, it, it's had a profound effect on me. And um, I think that people really have the desire to help others, and a lot of them um, just don't really know how to do so. Sure. And so once I found out about the Uncommon Student Award, the service project, I thought it would be a great opportunity to give back to the service project that has given so much to my family and I. Mm-hmm. And so what is your vision uh, with this project? 
what do you what, uh, what do you think um, can come to pass? How many lives can be uh, touched? And um, explain a little bit more, Dylan, if you can, about the project more specifically. We haven't really touched on that. Um, it's not um, a food pantry. Uh, it's not a clothing drive. It's it's a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, it's basically a tool drive. Mm-hmm. Um, I I based my project around donations from local businesses, um, private donations from regular people who have heard about it, mm-hmm. um, churches and so on. Mm-hmm. The approach that I've taken is um, I try to talk personally to as many people as I can mm-hmm. to give, I guess, more of a one-on-one um what I'm doing right now, sure. a one-on-one perspective of... Well, you can probably share your heart better in person than, than over an email or over the telephone. Exactly. And, I mean, I've, I've capitalized on using um, brochures and emails and stuff like that also. Mm-hmm. But um, the approach that I've taken has been a more personal one. And what I've been attempting to accomplish is to collect as many power tools mm-hmm. as possible. Um, I have a supply list, which I can give to you later and you can look through that mm-hmm. um, yes, please, I'd be interested. can you give us an example why tools well these these folks need tools down there is there there's some, a shortage or um, explain why tools well the Appalachian service project really thrives off of its off of its construction off mm-hmm. of the construction that it does mm-hmm. and all the times that I've been there I've had to use power tools provided by ASP or um, ones that my group bought by ourselves and brought with us. Mm-hmm. And I saw a real need for working power tools because, mm-hmm. I mean, the ones that I was working with, a lot of them were right on the edge of breaking, I mean, held together by duct tape on the cords, some yeah. of them. And um, I just, I saw a real need for power tools to uh, I guess, accomplish the goals that ASP was trying to accomplish mm-hmm. with construction and um, just strengthening the, the power that ASP would have. Mm-hmm. And for those of, of you who are watching out there uh, right now and you're interested in how you can lock arms with Dylan Johnson and um, do your part uh, by donating tools or a financial uh, um, donation, uh, Dylan, how can they reach you? Well, you can always email me at... Mm-hmm. Johnson Dylan D Y L A N sixty seven at gmail dot com, okay. and I'm open to any modes of communication. Or um, if anybody out there has any uh, donations or used power tools that they would be willing to get rid of, I'd love to get co- in contact with you and see if we can't work something out. Okay. We will also go ahead and put this information on the Solmonad website. So if you go to solmonad.com there and look at the charitable organizations that we lock arms with, you will uh, see a link that will bring you back to this contact information. So um, we we just ask you uh, if this tugs on your heart at all and you feel that that you really are called to to make a contribution through used power tools or brand new power tools or you just like to make a financial contribution, um, we ask that you follow through with that in uh, whatever the Lord has put on your heart to do. Well, Dylan, I'm just so amazed at the work that you are doing. Um, I've just always been impressed with your your mind and um, uh, your entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> Philanthropist in the making. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, I do. Absolutely. Yeah, I know your mother is here on set with us right now, too. And uh, Cheryl, don't you agree with that? Absolutely. <laughs> well, see, there you go. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to share with our viewers about the project, uh, about um, the, the folks down there in Appalachia, or any other closing comments? Um, I guess just if, if you have any more questions about it, you can go to www.asphome.org. Um, which is Appalachian Service Project's home website. One of the other things is currently Appalachian Service Project is trying to double their sphere of influence over the next few years. Fantastic. And they can't do that without the resources to do so. That's right. Um, I, when, when choosing applicants, or when selecting people who have applied um, through Appalachian Service Project to have their homes worked on, um, they can only work on a very small percentage of those homes, and all of which have a very real need for assistance. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but they can't help nearly as many people as they want mm -hmm. to simply because they don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. And that's really something that I'm trying to address. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it can't go anywhere without help from donors and mm -hmm. without help from people who are trying to support me mm -hmm. and my right. project. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that you do get a, a great deal of support. I feel that I feel that you will. Um, I know this, the viewers at Solmanad um, have big hearts. They're very compassionate uh, individuals, and um, I'm sure that, that they will open up their hearts and, and their wallets uh, to do their part to help you out. Okay, so Dylan, I wanted to cover just a little bit uh, more about the organization, the App, the Appalachian, excuse me, Service Project, or as you um, refer to it as ASP. So this was founded in 1969 here, and just looking at my notes, and it looks like they have had over 300,000 volunteers. They have serviced more than 15,000 homes, and on average, they have 17,000 volunteers. Those are incredible numbers. I know. It's, it's a big effort, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of people out there who recognize the, the need that we have in our own country and who enjoy giving back mm -hmm. also. Indeed. And um, if, if you are not familiar with this region, Central Appalachia, Appalachia, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, this region does cover um, uh, states of Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and of course, West Virginia. Uh, they do service uh, a total of 30 different communities. And they uh, actually have service projects that are available for adults uh, to, to um, hop on and, and lock arms with as well. Um, so if you go to their website and you want to go down with the team, I know that that's really been um, quite popular or increasing in popularity in recent years is, is um, adults will give up their vacation and um, they, they'll do what's called a, a working vacation. And instead of, you know, going and taking two weeks down in the Dominican to go on holiday, they'll go down and, um, and work uh, through a nonprofit organization such as this. So if you are one of those individuals that, that wants to go with some friends or family members or um, organization, your, your church or your, uh, your community, you can go ahead and go to the website and there's a lot of information there for you. And also I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, the numbers of people, the percentages that are beneath the poverty line. It's, it's pretty extreme, isn't it, Dylan? Yeah, well, I understand that one in four people in the Appalachian um, Mountain region live below the poverty line which is twice the national average. One in four beneath the, um, the poverty line, and it's twice the, the uh, amount there in that region than, than the national average? Twice. That's right. It's, it's crazy. And a lot of these people don't even have plumbing in their homes, do they? Do you have any, any numbers on that? Um, tens of thousands of people don't have plumbing in their house. I, I think the last statistic that I heard was around 21,000 people, who, 21,000 families who didn't have plumbing in their homes. Right, families, because it, living within that, that small space can actually be a high number of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, any idea about the uh, average household income? Around $20,000 a year, mm -hmm. which is a whole lot. Yeah, definitely consider poverty here in in the United States and and in this day and age. Yes, so the needs are the needs are great, mm -hmm. to say the least. Mm -hmm. The needs are great, definitely. You know, I heard that when you were down there this last summer, um, the organization ASP caught wind of, of your project and what was taking place, and you received some pretty exciting news, didn't you? Yeah, I definitely did. Can you share with the viewers uh, what it was that, that ASP told you about the, uh, the donations that you would be accepting? Well, I had found out that um, they had learned of my project and they wanted to embrace it wholeheartedly and um, they committed themselves to it and said that they thought they'd be able to find um, donors who would be able to match all the donations made in the name of my project. Mm -hmm. um, so. As I understand it right now, every donation that I make is going to try to be matched by Appalachian Service Project um, and the donors that they've found. So 
That's that's so impressive, Dylan. Um, and actually, there has been an anonymous donor uh, that has stepped up and is opening up their bank account to to make sure that all of this takes place. Isn't that so? Yes, from what I understand, that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a link on the um, Appalachian Service Project website uh, that has a little bit of my story on there um, with Tools for a Stronger Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I believe that um, the donation that they have been advertising there has raised $700 mm -hmm. um, just on the website. So right. if any of your viewers want to go check that out, <laughs> that'd be great. Absolutely, it would. So tools for a stronger tomorrow. If you have those power tools that you would uh, like to donate that we mentioned earlier, even use power tools or a dollar amount, whatever it is that you donate will be matched by the foundation. So uh, we encourage you to do that. How impressive that it will be matched. And um, I thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Uh, I know that great things are ahead uh, for you, and I look forward to uh, hearing the, the end result uh, of your project and all the, the lives that, that you will touch. Well, thank you for having me, Sonia, and congratulations on getting your show on the network. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, this is Sonia Doswell signing off from Soul Manad, uh, just for now. You be blessed in whatever you put your hands to do, and remember to inhale love so you too can exhale compassion. For now, ciao.